Hello, and you are listening to FPCast, the podcast for fruitless pursuits where we bullshit about the week in pop culture. I am Luke. And I'm Jacinta. And this week we're talking about... Camelot, mate. There'll never be another Camelot. Honey tits. <laughs> That's the thing. If you've ever longed for Arthurian legend where King Arthur refers to people as honey tits, mm. uh, Guy Ritchie certainly has you covered. He has made a movie just for you. Where people, where the knights call each other gov. Mm. Uh, that is the one. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. That is one of our reviews today. We're also going to review Amy Schumer's Snatch. Did I get that right? Hmm. And... <laughs> it's very... Oh, well, you're looking at me like I made a mistake. <laughs> no. Uh, no, never mind. Never mind. Uh, we're going to talk news. Some interesting news this week. Mm. I'm very impressed with the news this week. A couple of TV trailers today. Now even TV shows have trailers? I know, craziness. What is the world coming to? In the to? olden days, they just make the TV show. And then we're going to get to the end with some final thoughts about uh, that Eurovision final from last week because uh, we weren't able to talk about the winner, etc. at that point. Yes, and it's funny, in the days after Eurovision is when all the interesting shit comes out, so we're going to do a little bit of a catch-up on that and then put it to bed for another year. Sounds like a big jam-packed sandwich of a show. Mmm. So uh, let's kick it off, shall let's we? Let's take a big old bite. Out of the show sandwich. Yeah, the show sandwich. And uh, speaking of shows, TV shows. Now, Netflix, I have uh, been very fond of for quite some time now. Mm. You know, Netflix doing the Lord's work, giving us things like uh, Fuller House. Things that uh, we've been longing to see mm. back on the big screen, or things little that we screen. D- things that we didn't even know that we wanted. Computer screen. Mm. And, and they do a very good job, generally, of taking something that you love and putting it back on the TV and making it feel like that thing that you loved. Mm. Being very true to that. And, uh, you know, it's not even just Netflix. I was really impressed with, although I only watched uh, a couple of episodes of it so far, but Ash vs. Evil Dead. On stars. Yeah, I only watched a couple of episodes of it, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah. But they didn't hold back. You know, you think, oh, mm. this is going to be that small sort of TV version, which is never going to be the same as the, the original stuff. Mm. And then they just went nuts. Mm. So imagine my delight, this child of the early 80s delight at hearing that Netflix is going to do a 10 part series of The Dark Crystal. It's a prequel. Age of Resistance. A bringing, uh, working with Jim Henson's Creature Shop, mm. the Brian Froud designs, getting all those puppets back in action, and uh, not just, like, more Dark Crystal, but ten episodes of Dark Crystal. Yeah, and this came pretty much out of the blue. Like, I don't think anybody was expecting this. And then suddenly there's this beautiful trailer, which is not really a trailer, it's sort of a... You know, a look back in history of the the making the puppets, and there's a tiny little tease at the end. And I've got to admit, as someone who, probably when I was a kid, I maybe watched The Dark Crystal, like, maybe once, maybe twice, and it wasn't until I was probably a young adult that I started realising that Dark Crystal and Labyrinth weren't actually the same thing. As someone who doesn't have a lot of, kind of, memories of it, that little last shot, that made me really fucking excited. It's a Skeksis. Really excited. Turning around to face the camera, the Skeksis were the sort of bird creatures, Mm -hmm. the evil things. This is a prequel about three Gelfings who discovered the source of the power of the Skeksis for the first time, which I imagine is the, the Dark Crystal. Resistance... Mm. is a theme that is all over the place now, isn't it? I wonder why. What what have we got to resist against, do we think? Well, no, but it's funny that... (laughs) um, No, no, I mean, like... You know, everything sort of reflected because Star Wars brings us into this idea of resistance a couple Mm. of years ago. Now we've got Trump and we've got the resistance building. Everything's Mm. about resistance. Resistance Mm. is a buzzword. Now, this doesn't entirely come out of nowhere because there have been rumours of a Dark Crystal sequel 
going into product or it might have been even been a prequel uh, as a film mm-hmm. going into production for quite some time. And there was a point where it was going to go ahead with Jendi Tartakovsky, uh, Samurai Jack oh, okay. guy, yeah, yeah. and um, the very first Clone Wars miniseries mm-hmm. uh, directing it. And that all ended up falling through. And I think this is even better mm. in a way because uh, there's something great that when you watch these old movies, obviously the, the thing that makes that work and the real craft there is the puppetry and the design of the puppets. But when you look at things like here's the Skeksis castle um, sort of composited against a thunderstorm poorly, you know, all those sorts of special effects are things that somebody, a kid on his computer could do mm. to his YouTube videos these days. So, you know, being able to... To see the world refreshed. Yeah, to be able to do that now and, and not be a massive cost beyond... Uh, like, this is going to be about craft. So I, I just think that's fantastic that um, it's going to have room to breathe and, and we're going to get to develop some characters and see more of this world. So really excited about that. And, and it was a one-two punch from Netflix because it's like, oh, yeah, so how about uh, we give you some Dark Crystal? Great. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, oh, and uh, what about The Witcher? How about we make that into a series as well? How do you like them apples? I feel like we were saying not that long ago that it's hard to imagine a franchise or a thing that you would want to see made into film or TV that mm. hasn't been. I didn't think of The Witcher. Which is great. Mm. I've never played The Witcher, so I know nothing about it. Explain The Witcher to me. Okay, this is great. This is going to get you. Like, Witcher, it's a book series initially, mm-hmm. then a video game. Mm-hmm. It's about um, a guy. He's buff. He's got long white hair. All the lady gamers, like, love him. Oh, I've seen people cosplay as that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a monster hunter. Okay. And he goes around. There's usually, like, a, a big lead up to it. Like, he doesn't just go and fight a monster. He looks for clues and does detective work and looks at blood, finds out their weaknesses, talks to the village. Mm-hmm. He plans and plans how the... Like, Batman. Like, okay, this cool. is... It's weaknesses. This is how I'm going to go and take down this thing. Mm. Which is smart for a TV series as well. Because, obviously, he's not going to be, like, bash... They're not going to be able to afford to have him bashing monsters constantly. Mm. But I imagine there will be lead up and anticipation, and when those monster battles come in, that'll be pretty great. Mm. Surrounded by women, a lot of women characters. Okay. And basically, so you've got you've got that violence, you've got the monsters, you've got the fantasy, you've got magic, and then he fucks everything he encounters. Oh, okay. Like he's just fucking all the time yeah, in the right. game, and uh, I imagine in the books as well. Yeah. So, so no livestock are safe? No. Like, I think he, he certainly... Rounds of cheese? I think, like, he'll fuck a forest nymph or, or you know, something okay. like that. Like, if it's vaguely female in shape... Oh, okay. He's going to slay it. Mm-hmm. So, monster slayer, pussy slayer. Yeah. In the age of, like, oh, Game of Thrones is kind of running its course, what's next? <laughs> this is uh, just perfect. Like... Yeah, right. If you're... Look... Ladies, if you're answering a casting call for The Witcher, uh, read it very carefully because... Go and uh, visit your waxer before you do The Witcher. Yeah, 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 yeah. The waxer is the prequel (laughs) to The Witcher. It'll be a web web episode (laughs) of actresses preparing for The Witcher because uh, he's going to fuck you. And whoever plays The Witcher, that's going to be interesting casting Mm. because um, he's not a, like, young guy either. You know, he's, he's... pretty weathered mm. i think he's got like glowing eyes and um i'm not an expert on this game series if people had not guessed like i have it but and it's great but um i think i got a few hours into the both the second and third but uh really cool and the, the game has lots of great cutscenes and creatures and assassins and wacky stuff it's so good mm. like people love it for a reason so yeah. the fact that dark crystal and The Witcher? Mm. Like, what an age to live in. I know. You couldn't even imagine this 15 years ago, back when uh, I was uh, went down a bit of a Eurovision rabbit hole after the weekend and was going back through some really, really old stuff and was thinking of, you know, MP3s that I downloaded from early Eurovision stuff and thinking, fuck, this one song would have taken me an hour to download. Yeah. And you had to search and search and search to find 
anything on the internet back in these. And now it's being handed to us on a platter. Everything's there. Twin Peaks comes back this week. Yeah. It's just crazy. I mean, again, like, we do have to stop and pinch ourselves. Just the fact that, like, just even this year, you've got, what, Star Wars Episode Eight. Justice League, mm. Wonder Woman, Spider-Man. Mm. And that's the thing, Thor, like, not to sound like an old person, but we're, we're probably the last generation to remember the before times. Alien. All the, all the kids these days, they just, this is how everything has always been. Planet of the Apes? Like, yeah. that's all in one year. I know. Great, and, and we're so spoiled that there was a time when I'm like, they're doing a Transformers movie. Now we're sitting going, oh, fuck, we're going to have to sit through this Transformers movie. <laughs> Uh, it's just yeah. just incredible. Mm. We watched a new trailer for Transformers in which uh, nobody transforms. Yeah. Like, that was my problem with one of the other ones recently as well. It was just all robots. It's like, you got to play around with the idea that they can transform. That's the whole thing. Mm. Like, it, that it's was... right in the name. And that was the great thing. I don't mind that first movie, and I love that I, opening. I like, I like the first movie. With the helicopter. Mm. And this idea of, oh, shit, there's this helicopter here. You know, we're all approaching it, and then it turns into a robot and starts mm. moving. And you're like, fuck. It's like such a great cinematic mm. moment. You're, you're like just, you're swept up in the magic of the transformations. And now it's just the robots are having angst. And it's yeah. all about their angsty relationships with each other, not yes. the fact that you're going... I'm going to get in this car. Hang on, is that car going to, like, bite my dick off and turn into a robot and then kick my dick into the bushes? Mm. Might do. Mm. Is that a risk I want to take? Maybe. It's so, a pretty sweet car. Yeah. But, I mean, like, the whole thing is that, well, Optimus Prime goes bad and we're supposed to, like, care about his journey. I don't care about his fucking journey. Turn into a truck, Optimus Prime. Turn into a truck so that I'm just like, oh, fuck, he's a truck. He's a fuck truck. Fuck truck. If, yeah, if Optimus Prime is rocking, <laughs> don't come knocking Megatron. Or do, because, like, he's got a very big, uh, you know, trailer. There's a lot of room for a lot of people. So knock if you want to. Yeah. Room for everyone. There's not many um, female Transformers, are there? No, just RC, isn't there? Yeah. Mm. Like, yeah. Mm. Watch your exhaust pipe. You read that contract very carefully as well. <laughs> Ah, see. <laughs> I get up the ah, see. Ah, uh, I apologise for that. So, okay, let's let's continue on. Even more crazy news. Mm. So, this is another one of those things, just like the Dark Crystal, where there's rumours forever. So, do you remember when Sony was at the height of doing their Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies? And bear in mind, they only got two of them out. But there was an ongoing larger story that they were trying to put together. Like, in the second one, you got glimpses of the vulture's wings in the lab and the Dr. Octopus arms. Mm. There was this mystery about Peter's parents. And um, they they were going full-blown. They had, like, release dates for the third Spider-Man movie. They were doing a Venom solo movie spin-off. They were going to do a Sinister Six, mm -hmm. like a reverse Avengers thing where they were going to do a movie about all the villains together. And then it all just got scuttled. And they did the Marvel deal. So then they've been threatening a Venom movie and you go, well, I've heard this before, Sony. Come on. Where's your credibility? And Sony uh, do that a lot, right? Mm. Like Ghostbusters 3 was happening for <laughs> yeah. a billion fucking years. Every time, like, you Man, I, think, Murray... I think they just leak the rumours themselves just to keep yeah. people talking about them. I remember what that other trailer was. It's the Emoji oh, fuck. movie trailer. I knew there was another trailer we were supposed to watch. Mm. You can just talk to me about it because I feel like I know, I've seen it without seeing it just yeah. from what you said to me the other day. Yep, cool. All right. Um, so what am I talking about? Venom. And then we find out today that not only are they going ahead with this Venom film, but they've cast Venom. And uh, if you weren't interested in this film, I think this will make you interested. It feels like fan casting. It feels like... If if I didn't know that this was real, I would think that this was a complete joke. You you check the calendar. I would. You is go. It, is it the first? Yeah, someone trying to make a fool out of me mm. is what you'd be thinking. But then the picture in the article I had had a picture of him wearing a venom shirt, pointing to it. Mm. If that's not confirmation, exactly. What is? Tom Hardy. Yeah, craziness. Gonna be venom. Uh. I, look, Tom Hardy got a wait. I think, look, that's smart anyway as an actor. Like, do a big franchise movie, get all them uh, sweet dollars, and, and then that's going to allow him to do, like, three or four other things. Yeah, like that movie where he was in a car the whole time. Yeah. It was a good film. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember what it's called, but it was really good. Lock. 
Lock. Yeah. Yes, it was great. I still great seen film. it. I need to see that. Oh, it's so good, dude. So um, I'm excited about this now. I, I like Venom. I, I like Venom's look. I like Venom as a character. Not really as a character. It's a look, isn't it? It's just a visual. Yeah. Like, the, the I, don't, Venom, I don't know what Venom's personality like. Venom is like. seems to be one of those characters that is a bit... The sort of people that like Deadpool like Venom too. Yeah, maybe. That's kind of the, the Venom vibe that I get. But I've got to confess, you know, as a young teenager, you see pictures of Venom, you see pictures of Wolverine, you just think they look really cool. Mm. And we didn't really get that in the Sam Raimi one. Venom was such a afterthought. It was something that Raimi himself wasn't passionate about. And Venom's origin story kind of does require a movie. Now, I'm not saying that the the origin story is going to be the crazy convoluted bullshit. Well, we know it's not going to be the crazy convoluted bullshit from the comics. Mm. And there's been plenty of revisions in Ultimate Universes and stuff. I'm sure it'll be somewhere in the middle. But it needs some sort of setup as opposed to... He's Venom. Love you, Mary Jane. Oh, what's that black goop on my... Just fell out of space. Mm, don't know. I guess that'll be important in the third act. <laughs> um, you know, so... Also, the Venom that we got in uh, the Raimi one was about that sort of evil Spider-Man, mirror mm. Spider-Man. He was small. He was slight. If Hardy is not a big, hulking, mm. tongue-lolling Venom, I'll be very <laughs> surprised. And uh, I like Venom as a big prick of a guy, mm. you know? big uh, douchebag. So I think that's fantastic. So the only question I have now is... Will it ever happen, I think, is my question. It sounds good. Like, if they're announcing cast, I'd say we're in, mm. unless something goes horribly wrong. But I wonder... I mean, the Gambit movie was meant to happen. Well, that's true, and that's still <laughs> floating. They cast that, and that's yeah. still floating. But that was Fox. Yeah. Who knows? Sony's worse than everybody else, that's so true. I don't trust them. So, but anyway, anyway. But um, I, my only question is, does this mean Tom Hardy Venom exists in our Iron Man Cap universe? I would assume oh, so. Oh, okay. Because you would think you were doing a Venom movie to set him up so that he can be in a later Spider-Man movie. Mm. And if that's the case, you would think that unless something goes horribly wrong or Sony takes its bat and ball and goes home or something, that that would be the Tom Holland Spider-Man mm. So, if this is Tom Hardy's entrance into the MCU... Then cool. I think he, that's, he, that's really yeah, great. Yeah, he deserves that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm hoping that the MCU does continue to snowball and collect characters mm. and actors and uh, that they can keep everything under that umbrella. So, good for you, Tom Hardy. Enjoy your wheelbarrow full of money. <laughs> now, you tell me about this story because this is something... I know about one of these things, yeah. but not the other one. Yeah, so this is some supernatural news, which uh, there probably hasn't been any particularly interesting supernatural news for about seven years. Did you? I just heard some young girls squeal. Oh, yeah. Well, it, usually that's not the noise you hear from young girls when you mention supernatural. It's usually a bit more squishy. Squelchy. Yeah. Um... Supernatural, I, I would consider myself a reformed Supernatural fan. Uh, there was a couple of episodes in season six that made me go, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore. You watch five seasons of Supernatural? Look, the first five seasons were very good. They wrapped up very well because I did think they didn't know if they were going to get um, the sixth season. So they kind of wrapped things up in a way that they could have just left it. Then they got renewed and then they went on. Uh, I think they've just finished season 12. So... Yeah. Uh, in season 13, they have announced that they are doing a crossover episode, and they've, they've done novelty episodes in the past. Well, yeah, because what's left to do in thir 12 seasons, 13 seasons? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't know, because I haven't watched it for the last have, six years. Have they but, been puppets? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. There has been a musical episode. I think there has been some kind of cartoony sort of one before. Has there been a, a mind switch where mm. they're in each other's bodies? Oh, I don't remember one, but I expect there definitely would have been. been right? um, the, is there one where the boss is the boss is coming over for dinner and they have to impress the boss, but things are going wrong and then they have to keep running back and forth from the kitchen and they're smoking stuff and then they keep hiding the door and pretending that everything's fine. 
Mm, not really, because they don't have a boss. Their boss is sort of humanity, because they have to save humanity. The, the oh, humanity's um, coming over. The, the, the episode that actually broke uh, was a straw that broke the camel's back for me, which a lot of people love. Like, this is a lot of people's favourite episodes, but I just it just made me feel ill. Um, where they get switched into like an alternate dimension which is actually the real world and so they're walking around and people are calling them Jared and Jensen and then their actual wives from real life are in the episode did they go and into a alternate dimension or did they disappear up there in assholes yeah that was what i was more or less thinking and i went you know what fuck you show this is the most pandering bullshit i've ever seen i'm out where are we i think we're in our assholes <laughs> And when all of this stuff happens, it's usually um, con- uh, the blamed on uh, early on the character was Loki, but I think it's later revealed that he's the Archangel Gabriel or something like that. So I imagine that it'll be something along those lines, but the crossover they're doing next season is Scooby Doo. Mm. Supernatural X Scooby Doo. So will they, like, they'll go through. A dog's asshole, and then the whole thing will be animated? I would guess so, yes. And they'll probably, like, brutally murder some fucking monster or something, and it'll turn out to just be an old man who was trying to scare some kids. We haven't prepared for this, but can we just think of some things that probably will happen? Like, surely um, Velma or Daphne is going to be a bit swoony. Oh, Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, Daphne's, like, the sort of typical option. Mm -hmm. Like, that Daphne's like, oh, and Fred's a bit, hmm. Although Velma is the nerdy one. That'd be Sam. Sam and Velma would kind of like, hmm. Oh, so do you one will have a crush on one and one will have a crush on the other? Well, there'd be some kind of pairing off situation. Dean would be the one that would be more for Daphne. Sam would be the one more for Velma. Okay. Hmm. And, uh, yeah. There has been an image released of what it's going to look like, and it looks shit. Like, it looks really shit. Oh, no, it looks, it looks exactly as <laughs> well, it, it should. Looks, it looks exactly like Scooby-Doo, but it still also, also looks fucking shit. They're, like, maybe animated's a way to go, because they must be in their 50s by now. No, well, no, they're not. They're, like, they're in their 20s when they started. They're in their sort of mid to late 30s now. One of them has aged. The other one... Has AIDS? No, he's not a AIDS. God. No. no. There's a blind <laughs> item. That's a Fruitless Pursuits exclusive. Don't say which one. Allegedly, <laughs> according to Jacinta Scoop, one of the Supernatural guys has AIDS. Will we find <laughs> out on this very special episode of Scooby-Doo? <laughs> I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling kids. <laughs> You are Forget a... the mask, wear a condom. <laughs> you are a bad person, and I'm unsure if that joke is worse or better than a Supernatural crossover Scooby-Doo episode. I yeah. might have misheard, I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe. Well, somebody else will have to tell me how that episode goes, because I'm not fucking watching it. Well, I'm curious uh, about these brothers. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh, it's kind of like picking the door in Labyrinth, isn't it? <laughs> push on, push on. Okay, so uh, let's talk trailers, TV mm. trailers again. Now, this one <laughs> puts a little bit of a damper on the news I was excited about earlier. I didn't realise that this new Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery, is Netflix. Mm. And I think Netflix does such a great job of making things look awesome. But um, I know people are excited about this. And look, I'm not a Star Trek guy. I've had very controversial views about the characters of the next (laughs) generation. Um, So... Because TNG sucks. Yeah. (laughs) Apart from Riker, it was a gift from God. the worst character in the history of anything. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, I was curious about it. Uh, I think it's cool that Michelle Yo, Yo mm. is the captain. That's great. That is cool. And uh, but it just looks kind of cheap. Yeah, the first time I watched the trailer, I was like, I watched it without sound on at work, and I was like, oh shit, actually this looks kind of cool. I love Michelle Yo. Like this is all going to be great. I wasn't expecting much because I'm not a Star Trek fan either. And um, then I watched it again with the sound, and I'd said to you, oh, this Star Trek trailer doesn't look too bad. 
And then I watched it again later with the sound on. And on second viewing, mm, no, it just looks no like, good. It like it looks expensive, but it feels cheap, like a Doctor Who episode or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'm not saying oh, it's all fake and cardboard. No, boxes CGI and stuff, is it, bad. It, it just doesn't have that sort of atmosphere mm. or kind of grounding or feeling that you're watching something that's elevated Mm. you know you watch handmaid's tale you watch american gods you watch game of thrones you watch something and you go oh you know there's craft and art Mm. behind this whereas there's craft and art in the designs Mm. but i don't know it feels like when I'm looking at those aliens, I feel like I'm on the face-off stage, <laughs> you know, where they... That's the prize that they got at the end of the season. Yeah, it is that kind of vibe. It just... I just don't like the the look of it. Mm. Um, we'll give it a I'll, shot. Yeah, absolutely but, give it a shot. But, but, I mean, we're already a couple of steps behind not being Star Trek fans. No. I feel like if you're invested in this universe, then sure... Um, but there's there's no Star Trek TV show. It looks that like I a find. fan production. Yeah, and, and, yeah it does. and I mean that in like terms of not kids on YouTube, but like one of those slick yeah fan productions. And maybe that's just what it should be. Maybe that's the Star Trek vibe. That's maybe that's in the same way that um, Netflix didn't try and make Full House cool or ironic or different. Mm. They made it as exactly what it was so maybe that's all part of it and maybe that's also the appeal for people Uh, it will be on the strength of its characters Mm. but um when i was looking up uh michelle yo when we were talking about this the one thing that appealed to me that i think is really great about this whole story is her husband's name Mm. is dixon d-i-c-k-s-o-n poon Mm. Dicks on Poon. Yeah, I. Uh, when you told me that little tidbit of information, I quite reasonably did not believe you. Well, I always speak the truth. So well, that's... you always like to make silly dick jokes, and I went, no, Luke, that's ridiculous. And so I looked it up myself and was shocked to learn that, in fact, Michelle Yeoh's husband is Dixon Poon. So if anybody out there can take a karaoke track of Girls on Film and change it to <laughs> Dixon Poon and uh, make up some other lyrics about him being Michelle Yeoh's husband, send that and we'll play it. Yeah, we'll have it as a new uh, podcast theme song. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll make it my ringtone. Cool. And um, hang around in public a lot. <laughs> If no one calls me, though. No. Someone will have to call <laughs> the phone's me. always on silent. That's true. And then the other trailer, more trailers for TV shows, is this second X-Men-related series. Actually mentions X-Men in this one. Mm. Gifted, yeah. which is the Brian Singer one. Yeah, I think I first saw... I mean, I'm like, now I'm questioning what I actually saw, because I think it was maybe just a teaser for the trailer or something. It had a lot of the dude that has the long hair in it. And I didn't realise what it was because I'd completely forgotten that Gifted was happening. Who is that um, dude? Is that supposed to be Warpath? The, I have no you idea. You know, the guy with the... The, the um, in, Native American guy. Yeah, yeah in I, Days I, of Future Past. I don't know, maybe. Because one of the girls is Blink, who was yeah. in Days of Future Past. But yeah, in Days yeah. of Future Past, she was like purple. Yeah. I mean, this she's not. Mm, she has a bit of purple in her hair, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I turned the trailer this trailer off because I thought it was some shitty fan trailer put together thing and I went oh this is stupid I'm You're not really watching hard it. on the fans today <laughs> and um give up on your fan art your fan fix your fan films people yeah yeah I mean that's a good good across the board rule um unless it's alien covenant uh fan fiction because I would like to read that the yeah I thought it was a bit shit so I turned it off and then he went oh did you watch that gifted trailer and I went oh shit okay maybe I need to watch the whole thing um and we just did and it kind of reminds me of Heroes, you know, well, to be honest. Well, I never saw Heroes. Oh, okay. But you know how a lot of podcasts, you don't listen to them, just pretend, All right. um, are sponsored by mattress companies? I oh, yeah, feel yeah. like maybe Brian Singer is sponsored by a mattress company because he seems in the business right now of putting people to sleep. Mm-hmm. There is just nothing enticing about no. that. It's all angst. <laughs> yeah. And teenage angst. And just what TV super needs. Heroes. It's teenage angst with the occasional, like, superimposed energy effect coming yeah. out of somebody's hand. And building, like, shaking and stuff. Give us a fucking, like, a Brian Singer X-Men series. Give us an X-Men series. Give us some fringe X-Men. But give us some, like, 
suits and powers and, mm. and, and stuff. It's more just angst. Oh, that'll be at the end of season two if they and get teens. there. And teens. And right. look, typical America. You get superpowers. What do you do? Try and steal some chips from the vending <laughs> <Yeah>. machine. <laughs> to be fair, that's probably what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. Chips in vending machines are very expensive. Yeah, it looks like, okay. I, yeah, I don't know. I, it I, doesn't I, excite me at all. No, I mean, compared to, like, Legion or something like that, this looks leagues behind. It does, certainly in terms of the look. There's nothing mm. special about the look. It looks cheap, again, mm. saying it, sorry. But when you look at the shot, I mean, Legion is just fucking mind-bending, set-bending, reality-shifting craziness. Mm. This is like, and then a shot of the police cars and all the lights explode mm. and it just looks like oh yeah you got some cars and you rig some little explosives in there yeah good, you to, know. good to see that bill compton from um true blood is getting some work though i didn't even recognize that's anna paquin's partner yep I, I thought he was dreamy he doesn't look dreamy in there he was dreamy about 10 years ago yeah, yeah. <laughs> poor guy it's about parents dealing with kids that have powers i'm led to believe yeah, and it seems like, um, I think his name's Stephen Moyer, is the Bill Compton yes. guy. He, um, yeah, it looks like he's he's in some sort of task force or some sort of police type person that is responsible for uh, taking down or corralling gifted people, which is similar to Heroes in that um, the horned rim glasses guy, or Noah, I think he's called later, is... Yeah, has to get these gifted people, and it turns out that his kid is one of them, which is the same as in this show. Yeah, and yeah. also just the, the sorts of imagery. It's all those cliches that you've seen a billion times before. Mm. Teenagers getting picked on, they're getting bullied, and then, oh, suddenly a power Suddenly they've got power Manifests. Yeah. You know, we've seen all of this stuff so many times. Plus, it's one of those things that's putting up an issue and this sort of societal issue that... I don't imagine there's anybody that's going to watch this show going, ah, they should all be persecuted. Mm. I'm on the, you know, kill... You know what I mean? Like, it's... <laughs> yeah. You're going to watch a whole series of a problem trying to convince you to be on a side that you're already yeah. clearly on that side of an issue. Yep. And they're going to talk about this issue like it's... Like, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. It's... Mm. Ah, not interested in uh, Gifted. I think it looks like a bum. I just want a... Like, give us a series with the characters, uh, as superheroes with personalities that are a group and hang out and do cool stuff. I want a series with the exact cast of X-Men First Class that follows on from the... Oh, was it the end of First Class where they all come it's out of the suits? Apocalypse, the end they, of Apocalypse. end of Apocalypse where they have the suits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we never... You know, he finally put him in the suits at the end of that and then it's all gone to shit now because no one wants to do any more. Mm. Which is a shame, like, Brian Singer, what's he doing? He has more talent than this. Mm. That's what frustrates me. Like, I don't get on filmmakers and stuff's backs half as much as, like, a lot of people do. Because it's like, I, I'm still, I can't believe, no matter how awful you think the prequels are, I can't believe the rudeness and the shit and the way that George Lucas is treated like he's a criminal mm. or an offender or something. Like, can you imagine a world, and you can imagine it because we're living in it, where inventing Star Wars wasn't good enough? Yeah. Like, we can't go, oh, shit, like, you made Star Wars. Because mm. you think of anyone, our own endeavours, any projects, if any of us created something like that, just, you know, once in our lives that just everybody loved. Just sit back and take the rest of your life even, off. But even if the rest of everything you did didn't work, mm. you still did that thing. You, Most of us will never come near that. You gave humanity a great gift. Yeah. And just because you gave then gave humanity something that was a little bit subpar doesn't mean you didn't create the thing in the first place. But it makes you feel smart and superior to, like, shit on the man. But what I... Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's the thing. It's like me with Kevin Smith. I, I do agree that when talent is squandered... Mm. But there's a difference between... Like, Lucas got out of touch with the, hum the humanity of it because I don't think he has a very human life. Like, he's a sort of introvert, mm. and he's in his own world, and, and he lost the humanity of Star Wars. But he never lost his ambition, because, like, 
fucker, no matter what you think of Jar Jar Binks, that was revolutionary. No one had done anything like that before. He paved the way for so many things. When that trailer came, no one had done what he had done. They are revolutionary movies. He might have, like, missed the mark, and he certainly can't write dialogue or deal with actors, but holy shit, like, his ambition was there. Mm. Whereas Kevin Smith's ambition, where's that gone? And now I'm looking at Brian Singer and going, where's your ambition? And Brian Singer might go, hey, cunt. Apocalypse, the big blue dude there. Like, I tried to do all this shit. And then everyone hated it. No him. one liked it. Now, do you think I want to be working with these kids? I'm bloody gifted? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> TV is where real artists go to die. But that's what I've got. You think I can go and make another bloody usual suspects type movie now? Mm. No. No. Genie's out of the bottle. Brian's got to eat, yo. It's gone. i got to pay my rent. Yes. In LA. <laughs> yeah. Too so much money. So fuck you, do... Luke Milton, of fruitless pursuits. <laughs> That's, that is absolutely what he's saying. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, Olivia Munn was all dressed up with nowhere to go in that film. That's a shame. Should we talk about some films we actually saw? First up, King... What was it called? King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, mate. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, gov. And it wasn't even a dick euphemism. Hold up, honey tits, don't get your knickers in a knot, uh, is what the king said. Mm. Uh, well, he wasn't the king ca- at that point. That's his catchphrase. Yeah. Uh, so, yes, Guy Ritchie taking on some uh, English legends of yore. Mm. What do you think? Uh... Yeah, this was one I'd kind of been looking forward to. I, um, I'd i said to you what, a couple of days ago, I'm really, I'm really in the mood for a big, dumb action movie. I am a fan of Guy Ritchie. I am. I liked all his earlier stuff. Um, Man from Uncle, fantastic. Uh, he's been doing some good stuff. And, um, yeah, I think I, I mostly liked it. It maybe wasn't as big and as dumb as I was expecting it to be. Um, Charlie Hunnam is obviously playing Arthur, uh, Jude Law just eats up this movie as, um, Vortigan. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did, I did enjoy it. I thought maybe a little bit long. There's about 70% of this movie is just Arthur going, mm, I don't think I want to be king. And, uh, maybe could have been chopped down a little bit, but there's some pretty fun scenes, some fun moments, uh, some Good characters, and I can't really describe too much without spoiling stuff. Some giant elephants. Yes, there was some giant elephants. The elephants in the trailer are pretty much uh, just in the start of the movie, but um, they're very impressive. And, um, yeah, yeah, I, I like enjoy that it. sometimes, yeah. though, with, with one exception. When Hercules, remember when we saw Hercules yes. and all of those things, creatures that yep. he was fighting in the trailer, he mm-hmm. fights in a quick montage at the mm-hmm. beginning? That's fucked. <laughs> but the fact that the elephants are part of the first scene mm. is kind of cool. Like, don't you love it when you watch a trailer and you see this big action sequence and you think, oh, that looks I'm so have to wait huge. An hour and a half that's the, happen, that's yeah. the third act. I know yeah. what the third act is. And when a lot of the trailer stuff happens very early on in the mm. film, I always find that exciting because it's like, Because you don't oh, know what else is coming. Now, yeah. yeah, fuck, where we go from here? Mm. Like, that's great. Um, I agree with you. I think we're very much on the same page with this film. I believe that when it gets very Guy Ritchie, mm. which we're talking about um, sort of governor talk and a lot of... When they're having very fast-paced planning conversations. Yeah, fast-paced and- dialogue, montages, and flitting back and forth through time as people tell stories and yeah. explain things multiple um timeline sort of stuff i i really love that when mm. he just gets to unleash and do his thing it's really great yeah, when it goes full governor it is when the movie is the strongest and the funniest and uh when he calls people honey tits but there's actually <laughs> not a huge amount of that mm. and like you said there is a lot of soul searching and wandering around as mm. well and i also agree that it felt long yeah i think there were parts that were really belabored but when, yeah. when it moves it's great yeah i think it felt for me um i said to you after the movie it almost feels like a movie where guy Ritchie is a little bit at war with himself like he's got that really old his old kind of snatch lock stock style thing and then it felt like he had to kind of maybe give in to the studio a bit and have that 
classic kind of fantasy journey thing, which which has his personality taken out yeah. of it for most of it, which is unfortunate because I really would have loved them just to commit to the whole geezer thing. And it's funny because it's one of those things that would be easy to criticise and go, well, we've seen this from you, Guy Richie. You need to do more than that. But mm. at the same time, we haven't seen it in this context. Yeah. And I would have liked that because yeah. I think the film really comes alive when he's doing what he does best. Because mm. uh, as I said to you in the, in the car on the way back, in one of the trailers there's a shot of King Arthur as a child and he's getting bullied and it's that sort of Captain America and he's fighting. It's a sort of a cross between that Captain America origin story and the 300 um, mm. Spartans doing stuff. And I thought watching that in the trailer, oh, this could go on a bit. Like, do I really want to go backwards through his childhood? And Guy Ritchie does a really great job of turning up the speed at certain points. And that whole childhood is a montage with music, Mm. no dialogue. And it's fantastic. It's quickly paced. It tells a story packed with information. And it it was really engaging. Mm. And I, I wasn't expecting that. And he does that in other bits where you think someone sets something up and says, okay, exposition, exposition, we're going to do this, this, this. And someone's like, oh, but I'm putting up resistance to that. I don't know if we should. And then next shot, they're there. (laughs) Yeah. Which is great. (laughs) Like, you don't want to go through the bullshit. Yeah. Take us there. Yeah. It's like like the scene in Civil War where they talk about going to get Sam's wings and then they just um, suddenly have Falcon's wings. Yeah. Like, you don't need to see them doing it. Like, it's all, let's just believe that that happened. And so it's a funny... Because the praise and the criticism, because when he does that, Mm. the movie's so wonderful. And you think a movie that is so smart about, like, expediating things, how does it end up being so slow in parts? Yeah, and it's... And And maybe it is because it's so quick in other parts that when you go into a more standard storytelling mode, Mm. you feel that it feels like a burden. Yeah, and it definitely felt, when he's going through, like, it's literally probably an hour that he's going through this, oh, I don't want to be king, I don't want to, this is not for me, and um, it's basically an hour of him saying, I don't want to be king, and all of the other characters saying the same things to him over and over Mm. and over. Did you see what you needed to see? Would you... And I'm like, okay, guys, let's, like, let's, like, kind of snap this along a bit. Yeah, it's light on story. And I think you can have a simple story that's told well. That's fine. But, yeah, just keep that pace. Because, there are, yeah, again, there are certain parts where, like, when he goes to a certain place and battles certain things mm-hmm. and stuff, which <laughs> just comes out of nowhere and you're like, this is great. Yeah. Like, you suddenly perk up again. Yeah. So, because to get a sort of feel for this, it, it's part that Guy Ritchie thing. It's part sort of like Zack Snyder does... Arthurian legend. Kind of, yeah. It, it looks good. It's really atmospheric. Um, I kind of wish they'd... There's a lot of areas that I kind of wish they'd gone a bit more kind of 100% on. Like, I loved the... I guess the, the, the fashion. There's one part sort of later on where Arthur turns up somewhere and he's wearing like that full kind of tan coat thing and Mm. he looked really cool. That was the first point in the movie where I was like, oh, fuck yeah, he's a hero. Like he's wearing the hero coat. And um, I think they did it pretty well with with Jude Law's character. Like he was sort of lounging around like an Armani model for most of it. Gauntlets he had up on the balcony were really cool. All his armor was amazing. Yeah, Um, oh, and the eagle with the eagles on his shoulder. Yeah, they all had the eagles. Um, And all the armor was amazing. I just think for the like the hero characters, kind of lucked out in that area. The bad guys just looked amazing. Um, and it wasn't, and yeah, it wasn't until later on that the, the hero kind of, kind of got his moment, but, um, yeah, again, I wish the geezer stuff had been turned up to a hundred. I wish some of the costuming had been turned up a little bit more. Um, yeah, like it's, it's good and it's about what I expected, but I, I just kind of want that little bit of extra push. It's, it's hard. It's hard to... When you're saying that, you know, do we recommend or do we not recommend to an an audience of listeners? It's one of those things where, for you and I, seeing a movie every week, Mm. yeah, I had a great time. Like, I was entertained. I'm glad we saw it. That Mm. was a fine one for the week. Great. But if you're like that tight ass that goes to the movies, like, once every six months. Yeah, and you expect um, value for money. Then, yeah, you're not going to see this. No. So... 
Like it's and no one was. We went to an early session, but it has just opened, and there were six, six people. people in the cinema. Yeah. It's not going to be a, a popular thing. Mm. I think again, people really put up these walls of yeah, well, that looks dumb, or that's the, you know mm. the way they do with Zack Snyder and all that. I don't, I just mm. don't get that. I I've, guess I've, maybe it's a luxury and, and a privilege that we. Oh, it is. like Well, we choose to go and see things. People choose to do other things as well. But yeah, look, it is absolutely luxury that we have the expendable money that we can go and see a movie every single week. But, like, I've seen people saying, oh, no, the Arthurian legend is very important to me, and so I don't want to see King Arthur because I don't think it's going to be respectful to that. And I'm just like, for fuck's sakes. Just like fucking yarn at the cinema. Yeah, like, I like dinosaurs, but I'm not going to go and not watch a fucking dinosaur movie yeah. because it's not going to be true to the dinosaurs. It was fucking King Arthur go and see it as dude with swords and fucking massive elephants and big yeah. snakes and all sorts of shit go and see it it's fun I was having a conversation with a, a, a friend who talked about a another friend who I don't know mm. so but was basically doing that thing which you've heard people say a billion times before so so why this person was saying it and feeling like they were being unique and this was an adult mm-hmm was saying, oh, yeah, no, I don't like Star Wars. I like Star Trek, and Star Wars isn't real science fiction. And you know that you've heard that a billion times. Mm-hmm. It's like a, a total cliche. So the fact that someone would stand there with a straight face and say it like, and that's just crazy to me, this idea of... It's one or the other. Yeah, it, it's like um, console war stuff, which is kids. It's kids going... Well, I've got the Nintendo, so I hate the Xbox. Or I've got the PlayStation, so I hate the Xbox, and vice versa. Mm. And it's because you're picking your tribe because, well, I've got to invest in one thing. I can only invest in one thing. Mm. It's like, I got both. They're both good. Yeah. They're both fun. I, like... I mean, it's okay to have a preference. Like, I definitely prefer Star Wars over Star Trek. Oh, I do too, but i got an open, like, mind to it. People might not think that from what we said before. <laughs> but no, I'll, we, I'll give we it, I'll like give it a Star- watch. Like the first Star Trek movie. That was good. The following Star Trek movies, eh. But I've got one thing that I like out of Star Trek. Oh, I, lo- I like the sort of... And I like Kirk. I like the shatner sort of stuff. Mm. I, you know, there's I like, fun I like, in there. I like it's the concept. Control. I like the concept of it. I just don't want to have to watch the uh, original series to, to get much more oh, of look, it. You don't have to like everything. That's, not, I guess, what I mean. It, it's oh, no, about... I mean, like, I, I, like the, I like the Shatner thing. I like the Kirk idea but i just don't want to watch a lot of it but everybody's like that people there are millions of people the majority of people are like that with every comic character we're talking about Mm. like the idea of wolverine you watch a wolverine movie if you sat and read your regular monthly wolverine comic you'd be like what the fuck is this shit Mm -hmm. for the most part Mm. you know but you like the concept you like the idea of it but but what i'm saying is like I, i don't love star trek and i criticize some things but i'm not putting up a kind of, oh, no, but let me educate. Star Wars is better because it's nothing to do with Star Wars, what I feel about Star Trek. Mm. And really, every time with Star Trek, new movie, new TV series, whatever, it's a total clean slate for me. What have Mm. you got? I'll see it. Let me check it out. Is this something I'm interested in? Is this something I'm not? You know, when that, like you said, when the Abrams Star Trek trailer came out, it was like, oh, this looks cool. I'm going to see this. Mm. So... You know, you find the good and bad. But that idea of applying some sort of moral or intellectual mm. high ground to why I'm not going to see this, or do, mm. that's silly to That me. is silly. You that, are cheating yourself. Well, it's just like you don't have to be interested in everything. Go, I'm not going to see um, Guy Ritchie because my life's... Guy Ritchie's King Arthur because my life's too short and time's too precious mm. and I've got no interest in it. Yeah, F- fair fine. enough. Great. Fair enough. But again, often compare pop culture to ice cream. It's like you don't choose strawberry because you've got a moral or ethical or intellectual um, grudge against chocolate. Mm. That's just ridiculous. You like some things, you don't like others, you'll try some things, you can eat three bowls of this and maybe you have Until you get sick and then eat some more. A bite of this one and you're done. Mm. You know, like, it's fine. So if you are that fucking person at somewhere going, oh, no, but this, 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 then... 
It's not respectful to the legend, but I'll watch the Merlin. It's not respectful to me! But they'll, they'll piss on about this, but oh no, the Merlin TV show, very respectful. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and by the way, in terms of wrapping up King Arthur, uh, very much set up for a franchise, isn't it? This idea of that this is going to be this ongoing thing. Yeah, I think there I was... I can't imagine will happen. Yeah, it was was a bit weird. I think I had heard talk that he had wanted to do, like, like a trilogy or, like, five movies or something crazy like that, and people were going, oh, they're going to... They want to do, like, five King Arthur movies, but they're not going to do a sequel to The Man From U.N.C.L.E., which if he'd said to people, like, three years ago, you're going to want a sequel to The Man From <laughs> U.N.C.L.E., people would go, you're fucking crazy. What are you talking about? Man From U.N.C.L.E. is so good. Yeah, and that's just economics, hmm. isn't it? Well, because no one went to fucking see Man From U.N.C.L.E. And no one went to see this, so this won't happen either. Hmm. So if you were getting upset that, you know, that we're going to make five of them, the chances probably are not. they're probably not going to. <laughs> but, you know, with the way that, like, it comes up on the opening titles, King Arthur, and then it throws in Legend of the Sword. Hmm. And this really is about the sword. If you're expecting to see Lancelot, Merlin in this film? No. No. But the door's open for the future for that. Mm. They mention Merlin, but he's he doesn't appear. He couldn't be asked, quite frankly. Mm. Yeah, he's just sitting in his little hut in the woods, just, like, making himself dinner through magic in his hands. But in age of superhero stories and superhero stories that are derived from myth and legend, it makes sense to go, well, we're going to go back and we're going to take this character from English legend mm. and make him a superhero essentially and tell movies about it he did that with sherlock holmes mm. successfully for one movie two mo- yeah but they, they made two <laughs> yeah so you know i guess that's what they were doing i'll say one thing as well one other thing i might i might even limit myself i'm not going to even put boundaries or promises on okay. that i might say a few things i don't know but i thought the way they handled excalibur when he like actually fights dudes with it mm was really cool mm. because you need that sort of gimmick and that kind of feeling of what does this weapon do, how does it fight, and that's a big part of sort of creating a superhero as well. Mm. And it reminded me of, you know, when you see a lightsaber for the first time, you're like, oh, this is really cool. Mm. Like, I love the way this works. I love the sound it makes. I love the effect it has on people. And um, when he, like, really starts plowing through people with that sword, I'm like, yeah got a thing here like i can see mm. this series about charlie with his super sword mm, and and the, i love the oh, i don't think it's a spoiler but the mechanics of you know you got one hand on it it's just a sword you got two hands on it magic sword and then yeah. that sort of develops as the movie goes on but not a um, euphemism no no there was no fucking sword joke shaft jokes nothing it was oh actually there was sort of one David Beckham had a cameo in this movie, which is a far larger cameo than I was expecting. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Don't, that was... Yeah. Oh, we're not going to spoil Don't it. Don't say anymore, but yeah. But it was pretty... Quite You're funny. Right. It was pretty funny. You're right. Yeah, that was uh, that was a thing. So, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, was, it's, what, what it's, would you give it on Letterboxd? Oh, I'm torn. I'm Like, I'm tempted to go three because it's an aesthetic and a kind of... I would give it three. And, and a sort of... This is kind of my jam, you know, yeah. like sort of the movies that I like, this is what I'm into. And even though I do think it was too long and, and quite laboured in parts, it's something I enjoy. Jude Law was just magnetic as the villain. It's out of fantastic. Five, you know, two and a half right down the middle. Is it a little bit above the middle? For me, it is. It is, yeah. yeah I think it would be, I'm not going to go and see it again at the movies, I wouldn't think, but... There's some of those fight scenes, um, it is showing in 3D in some places. Some of those fight scenes were oh, clearly made that would for have 3D. Been really cool in 3D. Yeah, um, and I think some of those those battle scenes, especially ones towards the end, yeah. were very much made for 3D. It's all the arrows and stuff and coming at your face. All the stuff and the thing. Yeah, it's gone soon in 3D, people. Yeah, if you get a chance, there was only fairly limited um, screenings. If there'd been one before lunch today, I would have gone to do that, but. Um, they were only quite late this evening. Uh, I I think it would be I think it would be fun in three D, but I'm probably not going to spend the money to go and see it again. No, well, not with all this, you know, lots everything of, that's lots coming, is coming up. up. Yeah. Lots is lots is like the man. Lots is coming up in the movies. <laughs> We've still got some stuff to get through. Okay, we're running out of sorry. time. Let's go. Snatched. 
<laughs> okay, so I wanted to, like, people have been shitting on Snatched, okay? The Amy Schumer, Goldie people Horn movie. People have been movie. shitting on Amy Schumer. They have, um, and in some areas I don't think it's completely unwarranted because Amy Schumer characters seem to kind of be, let's watch Amy Schumer learn how to be less of a fuckhead. And, like, that's not a fun time. No. Really. But it's... Yeah, but I don't think it's... And, I mean, it's the execution. I mean, Trainwreck was that, but also that was funny. Yeah. This is that same thing, but it's not funny. Okay, well, look, we both don't think it was, like, a, you know, a complete and utter disaster, but it doesn't <laughs> It doesn't really work. It's not a particularly good film at all. No, I, I would not recommend no, definitely, paying money to see this in any circumstance. Don't recommend it. Uh, it wasn't great. Um, and I think you would be annoyed by it. But I, I think what's happened here is that... Because it's also written by Katie Dippold, mm. who wrote Ghostbusters. I really enjoyed that script. Um, you know, and I, I hate the fact that this isn't very good. Uh, it's got flashes of... Like, I think some of the lines and jokes are actually quite good, but the mm. story is just this sort of weird episodic vignettes and the whole thing's probably about 70 minutes long you know it, it's mm. there's nothing there and i mean it's hard to like you're making a comedy about women getting kidnapped and assaulted yeah like, you know well, well, i just feel like this is a very clear example of and, and i don't know the the background of it but my feeling would be that this movie has been rushed in because of the allure of Amy Schumer has done Trainwreck. This was a big thing. She's a star now. And, oh, we're going to get Goldie Hawn to do a film after 15 years break, and they're going to work together. Mm. This is perfect. We need something for them to do. And get Katie Dippold, knock it all out. Mm. But, but I feel like this wasn't a, oh, we've got this great story. Who can we cast in this? This has to have been the other way around. Mm. Like, we've got this cast. They want to work together. They're excited. We're excited to have Goldie Hawn back. Katie Dippold, what can we... Let's bring board some stuff. What's it about? Let's do... You know, because mm. it, it just... There's no way this could have been written first and then be found. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there is some... Look, I was expecting it to probably be much worse than it actually was. Um, there was a few bits that I laughed out loud. There was one bit in particular that just had me absolutely crying. It was so funny. <laughs> Um, but I can't really, uh, if you, if you have had the misfortune of seeing it, the bit with the tapeworm is the bit that just absolutely killed me. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's not a very funny comedy and... No, and it's, it's, it's just, not, uh, and it's uh, not very good for her. I really like Amy Schumer. I don't like the fact that she gets shat on all the time. I hate that um, because I think if, you know, you watch a sh Again, it's almost like that George Lucas thing where people are like, well, what have you done for me lately? And it's like, yeah, but she has done some really important work and said some really important things that weren't being said. Not in this film, mm. but in, in previous stuff. And I think she's on this trajectory now, which we've seen happen plenty of times before. The, the thing that reminded me the most of was probably Jim Carrey's trajectory mm. because you had Jim Carrey just suddenly break really big with Ace Ventura and it was something that he'd obviously had a lot of passion for and poured so much energy into and then it put him on the map it was like who's this guy this is great but then it's like how does everybody else capture that energy and profit from that energy and then you have to rush him into the mask and the mask goes, well, you're that wacky, crazy mm. guy, so we're going to use that. But it doesn't have the heart of what he did with Ace Ventura. And look, mm. I've watched Ace Ventura again a couple of years ago, and it doesn't stand up. It's pretty awful. But it's, you know, when that person suddenly becomes a commodity and you go, well, let's use that and let's use that essence of what it was that makes you popular. So, yes, she's playing a very similar character. Mm. But the, the difference is... It doesn't have the heart. There was something where she managed to take those situations and things in Trainwreck for me and make them real. Like, that was it was more grounded and... I think she had a better supporting cast to work with in Trainwreck And she Trainwreck acted too. like a human. Mm. Like, there wasn't this thing where the joke was 
pulling her all the time as yeah. opposed to... It's like in, in this, they're in perilous situations and she doesn't notice because she's, like, taking photos for Instagram. It's like, that's that's not what a person would do. Yeah, she's... I understand this is a comedy, but also that's not funny. Yeah, she's never in the moment. And yeah. those things work if there is some sort of grounding, mm. if there is some sort of cause and effect, if the situations feel real, mm. but the characters are funny. Whereas the, in Snatch, for me, she's just a joke machine. Mm. Just one liner after one, one liner, or the cutesy little girl sad voice, and it never really is real. Whereas, and because of it, you watch it and you you don't think, oh, you know, she's a great performer. Like it doesn't really stand out. She's fine. I find her endearing. I know a lot of people don't, but there's nothing in there that says, oh, you're an actor. Mm. Whereas, I still want to get teary when she does the speech at the funeral in Trainwreck. Mm. Like, there were moments there where she was a performer. And you could tell there were a lot of real things in Trainwreck, like a lot of experiences to do with family that that had come out there, whereas this is really hollow by comparison. Mm. There's some... uh, She didn't write it, but she did rework some stuff. Like, she has said that she wrote in the bit with the boob. She makes the joke about... um, her vagina smelling like soup, which she also uses in her comedy special recently as mm-hmm. well. So that's what I mean. It's like grasping for material mm. as opposed to... And I guess that's hard when you, you you see those situations where people gather material over many, many years and then they bring out this thing that they really wanted to say and that incorporated all these things they were thinking about and it's really successful. And then they're expected to do it again within a year. Yeah. Yeah. And they just don't have it. Mm. So uh, that's what I feel has happened here, mm. which is a real shame. Um, but I think all the vitriol about it is just ridiculous because there are absolutely hundreds of male comedians yes. and actors and everything that do a good movie and a shitty movie and, you know, people I love, like Paul Rudd and stuff, are in a lot of shitty movies mm. as well, you know? Yeah, and I think that the fact that... I, I Like, I haven't seen that many people shitting on this film and going, oh, well, you know, why does it even exist? It's so stupid and stuff. Um, but, I mean, for every one snatch, there's, like, ten Paul Blart mall cops. But that's her know? danger is, like do you go that way and become this sort of parody mm, of yourself? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not talking about Amy Schumer particularly. I'm yeah. just talking about the type of movie yeah. that it is. Like, I look, I don't mind if these movies exist because there's a lot of dumb man comedy movies out there. And look, you know what? Part of equality is having the same shit that we can have too. And I'm worried a bit that that, um, that new Scarlett Johansson, that night, big rough night, night, rough night or whatever, is going to be the same kind of thing. But I'm not saying these movies shouldn't exist because if there's a market for the, the men doing dumb shit, then why can't we do dumb shit well, too? Well, they're commercial ventures. Hmm. That's what they feel like. They're commercial yeah. ventures. They're not somebody's, like, you know, pouring their heart out thing. You hmm. can see that with... Because you look at the trailer for Rough Night, there's a lot of people in there that I really like and a lot of really talented people, but it feels like... Bad. It feels like a a producer (laughs) has assembled the Avengers and gone, well, you're popular, you're funny, you're popular, Mm. here's a script, let's put it all, you know, an excuse to put you all together. Mm. But it's not someone's heart and soul out there. It's not a passion project from anyone. Because, uh, you know, I'm sure an episode of Broad City would be better written than... Rough night. Mm. But there you go. Mm. And I was thinking again, because we didn't get the trailer today, but it was showing snippets of it in the foyer mm-hmm. and while we were waiting for you. And, um, yeah, I was like, this is the only film, I think, where Scarlett has female friends in, <laughs> you know, 50-odd mm. films. And it doesn't feel real. Like, when they're all reacting to something and she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm reacting too. We've just had this weird experience. I'm thinking... <laughs> You don't know these people. You're not close <laughs> to these people. They're intimidated by you. She's the outsider, and she mm. plays the outsider very, very well. Mm. But, yeah. We're still going to see it. Yeah, we'll see what yeah. happens. Not long now. Um, mm. So that was Snatch. Now, let's wrap up with a final bit of Eurovision chat. Mm. Talk about the final. I did end up watching it. Mm. So last week I had said in a slightly convoluted and maybe vague way that in the moment that the winner was announced, I wasn't 
like super happy, but then things happened afterwards that did uh, give me peace over the decision. I thought you were an absolute crazy person when you said that. I thought you were just making stuff up. I mm. thought you were leading us all on a merry chase down the garden path mm-hmm. after some geese. But um, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, <laughs> nailed it. So Portugal won by a significant margin. And I was like, oh. And whenever anyone wins by a significant margin, I don't care who they are. I'm always a bit, oh, God, that's so boring. And let's contextualise this. Portugal's song is very small. And he's not even on the big stage. He's on a small stage. Yes, and the reason for that, um, it's, it's a very quiet song. It's a quiet it's, it's song. It's a beautiful love song written in, it's in Portuguese, um, but he isn't he isn't on the main stage with a lot of, um, you know, fireworks and flash and bang and all that sort of stuff. The reason being because he, um, hearing different stories, I thought that he had a heart condition and was not able to be away from his doctor for more than a week, so they couldn't really do the intensive rehearsals like a lot of the other artists were doing. His sister had to come over and stand in for him. And another story I heard was that he'd recently had heart, like open heart surgery, so that's why he couldn't be away from his doctor. In any case, he came in fairly last minute, and so they couldn't have a lot of staging for him because they weren't able to... Oh, it was it was perfect. Totally deliberate. No, well, I mean, it was, but they had to work within some constraints because the rehearsal process for Eurovision is so intense and, like, militarised down to the second. But what he's doing there is an incredibly clever thing. Like, you watch his hands in his hand gestures and the way that he is drawing that attention Mm. with the hands and sort of almost conducting out those Mm. words. He has a very kind of eccentric sort of manner. But it's a... For me, it's like a puppeteering device. Mm. It's like when you're... Everybody do this. If you're on a train, sitting at your desk, do whatever. Like, um, imagine your hands like a puppet and it's talking. It's like Kermit the Frog. You're, You're talking... Now, if an audience is watching me do that and I'm talking with Kermit and I'm looking at the people or I'm looking at the ceiling or whatever, you don't have that message. But if I focus on my hand, Mm. if I watch my hand, if I watch that puppet, you're going to watch that puppet too. Mm. And I feel like his gestures were almost like plucking at the words that Mm. were coming out of his mouth. Mm. Like he, they put importance you knew, even though we couldn't, I, like, I didn't watch it with subtitles, mm. even though I had no idea what he was singing about, I knew that the words were important mm. because of the way he just created this magical little space. He was even sort of hunched over with his arms mm. up around the microphone and his mouth and the words. Mm. And, the, I mean, I, I feel like you maybe couldn't get the feeling quite as much on TV, but multiple times that, like, our Australian host during the semis and the finals said that, Whenever this guy performed, you could hear a pin drop yeah. in the stadium. Like, people were so enthralled by him when everything else is so loud and flashy and whatever, and then this guy comes along and it's so quiet and beautiful. And it was classical and beautiful. It wasn't like a poppy song mm. at all. So Yeah, and, I mean, he was very invested in this song because it was uh, composed and written by his sister. Yeah. And he, you know, loves his sister. His sister had come over and done, been his stand-in in rehearsals and, and stuff like that. And so... He wins. It was all very sweet because the camera was on him. He, his whole team is celebrating. He has not clicked that he has won this thing. And the camera's on him and you see him mouth, we won? And then everyone's going, yes, you won. Oh, my God. And he's sort of like, oh, 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 my God. Like, he still... was very humble as well. Yeah. That was a wonderful thing about him. Yeah. And so he came up with the uh, the three musketeers, the delightful hosts, and he gets up there and sort of does a little bit of a speech and sort of, you know, make a comment about... Um, you know, real music isn't fireworks and it's nice that, you know, a real song kind of won. And I'm like, oh, okay, dude, cool. But did not in an arrogant way. He said that he was so proud that they were putting the emphasis back on to music. He, sa- mm. he said a lot of music that comes out, and he wasn't specifically talking about Eurovision, but he said a lot of the music that comes out is disposable. Mm. It's fast food music. It's true. How can anyone deny yeah, that? Yeah. And... He said music is not fireworks, which, you know, fuck you to everybody that literally had either fireworks around the stage <laughs> or in their visuals which on is the screen. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, he won, and then he kind of so a man, of, a humble man, a yes. man of taste, a man of integrity. Mm. And then, so what happens after um, they win is they sing their song again, which yeah. is great, fantastic. We want to hear the song again, and he just says to the host, "Oh, but I want to sing with my sister." And you just see this slight moment of terror pass in front of the host's eyes as he just wanders off to go and get his sister. Because as I said, Eurovision rehearsals down to the second and they're just having to vamp and vamp and vamp and just talk about how, oh, Ukraine is so open and wonderful country. And I'm like, ah! And then... (laughs) So he's gone down back to the little stage. His sister is there. Some tech, poor technician has had to go and find a microphone within about four seconds for her. Oh, no, it's still the one microphone, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. No, it was just one microphone. It was the same setting and everything. Um, so fuck they that get there. imaginary technician. <laughs> oh, well, the, the, that is probably a real technician who got to put his feet up for four seconds. So, yeah. you know, this is the first time all night. He's got to relax. Well done to him. Um, they get up and they sing the song as a duet. And, like, if the song was good before, it was fucking unbelievable And now. there was that moment, too, because you're thinking, okay, you're bringing your sister up. That's like, sweet. Yeah. But, you know, you've just sung this song really yeah. beautifully, and now she's going to go, you could just feel that release and magic and just awe when she sang that, her first line, because yeah. it's like, oh, not only can she sing, she's, she's just uh, as good, if not better. Yeah. She's just brilliant. And the adoration in his eyes as he was watching her sing was just like, oh, fuck, I'm in love with this moment. I've never loved a Eurovision moment more than yeah, this. Yeah, and they shared the song. It's a song that they didn't perform together in the lead up yeah and uh i'm sure it's a big breach of the rules i'm sure that um someone got their fingers broken or something like that but oh my it was beautiful it was a beautiful beautiful yeah. moment yeah so i recommend watching that it was really yeah if uh, i put it up on the facebook page in my big kind of eurovision yeah. spammy thing but um yeah after eurovision that's when all the shit starts to hit the fan a lot of people were pissy about portugal um winning because it was another ballad and people people don't like ballads winning eurovision for whatever reason and um it well, was, it vote, was, you dickheads. well yeah i mean that's the thing isn't it and um it was a it was a love song, and people were like, oh, we're sick of love songs winning Eurovision. And the reason that people were kind of a- uh, antsy about that is because the Italian song was, you know, one that had a bit of a message. It was called um, Ox- Oxen to Dali's Karma or something like that, and which translated to Westerners' Karma. And it was when I first saw the performance in the video without subtitles, I was like, oh, this is a little bit... Mm, they had a lot of like East Asian imagery and kind of words and stuff. I was like, oh, this is a little bit problematic, isn't it? But th- that was the whole point because it's a song about how white people do dumb shit like that. And a lot of people were saying, oh, it's a song with a message that should have won. It was very catchy. I did like the song. Um, so that was people were pissed. Did they come second? No, they didn't come anywhere near. I oh, think that right. they maybe maybe came top ten. I think. Oh, well, then people didn't care. I know that's the thing, and that's the, the so because some people cared. Now we got to yeah. Look, Eurovision fandom is you know you think like fucking supernatural Star Trek fandom whatever is bad. Eurovision fandom pretty bad too. Um, so that was kind of the main thing that people were pissy about. Um, it really divided 50-50. A lot of people were like, no, Portugal was an amazing song. People connected to it. Portugal's, you know, um, never won before. And it was such a great story, And blah, 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 which I'm absolutely on the side of that. But a lot, a lot of other people didn't like that he won. And they thought, and they thought, oh, he just won because he sang in Portuguese. And I'm like, well, no, like a lot of people sang in their native uh, language, so that doesn't really work. It was brilliant, and what you said was just absolutely true. Like, if you saw it the once, you would appreciate it, but to see how that ended, mm. like your love for it will just, your heart will grow, like the Jim Carrey, aforementioned Jim Carrey's Grinch. Yes, you just you can't not love it. Mm. The other. Um, well, a minor controversy, which I think kind of fizzled out within a couple of hours, is that the Croatian guy, the du- guy who duetted with himself, who we both loved. Yeah. A lot of there was stuff coming out going, oh, he's like super homophobic and some gay magazine had voted him homophobe of the decade in like 2013 yeah, right. or something crazy. And he's come out and he's like, well, like, no, like, not really. I think that everybody deserves to love who the hell they want to love. And so I didn't see much more about that story but a lot of people were like oh we loved you and you you know we you know we were rooting for you and you betrayed us and i was like oh fuck guys like just 
if there's someone from a middle an Eastern European country who's homophobic, I imagine they'd probably be in the majority at this point. To be honest, I don't know. Um, I don't know anything about that. So no, no. So it was a, a the bit. Review, the views of Jacinta um, like, was... don't necessarily reflect my views. Like when she said that guy from Supernatural has a oh, fuck off earlier on. Now this guy's homophobic. You're making a lot of wild claims today. Anyway, so that was a bit of a fizzer. I haven't heard much else about that. But the other thing that was going on on Tumblr is a lot of Spanish people were really filthy that their guy got five points. And I was like, oh, well, that's fair enough. He came dead last, by the way. Dead last. If people don't know the scoring. Five points is not great because it's Portugal very, very bad. got over 600. Yes, um, but then it seemed they were angry that they got any points at all. And I'm like, that is confusing. I need to investigate this. So Spain was the guy with the longish blonde hair. Hawaiian shirts. Hawaiian shirts, singing a Jack Johnson-y kind of song. Uh, and it wasn't great, but it wasn't l- worthy to come last, I didn't think. Um, I thought it was balls. It was balls, but there was lots of other balls happening there. Uh, And what had happened is a lot of the countries have an American Idol or X Factor style show to qualify their contestant for Eurovision, which Spain had done. And there was two that it had come down to, this guy and a lady. And the lady was very popular, and apparently she had won the popular vote for this. But something happened, and... The jury, there was like a judging jury, overruled it and put this guy in instead. And then it came out later that one of the judges was actually friends with this guy or had known him previously in the past. And so all the Spanish people were like, this is dodgy as fuck. I hope he gets embarrassed in front of the entire world, which he did. Uh, But they wanted him to have zero points. They wanted this guy to just be fucking ruined. If you want him to have zero points, don't put the drum kit on a surfboard during the uh, bridge because that was the bit That was five point worthy. That was worth five (laughs) points. I'm like, they're all on surfboards and the drum kit is on a surfboard Mm. and I'm like, drum kit on surfboard? I haven't seen anything like that before. It was really good. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, so that's uh, that's that, really. Eurovision all done. Until next year. Any uh, top picks on who will be representing Australia next year? Ooh. Shannon no. Noll? No. I, I know there's a lot of people that want to send Shannon Noll for a bit of a joke, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. I was actually thinking someone who I really didn't like when I was a kid just through overexposure was Tina Arena. Um, but I think she'll be perfect for Eurovision. She's uh, she's uh, multilingual, and uh, just that big stand and deliver belter ballad. We should have one of those. I think I think Tina Arena would be fantastic. I can't even really think who would who they would send because they're running out of uh, good quality reality show graduates to <laughs> send. I think. Yeah, we don't have much here in, in terms of uh, culture off of the rest of the world, so. Well, in terms of Eurovision quality pop, I think we've... Uh, like, Dami Im really was our peak. I'd want a Dami Im the first year. I think Guy did a really good job. I thought um, Guy was pretty great. Guy was my guy. Mm, but, um, yeah, once Dami... I'm just like, why don't we just keep sending Dami every year until we win? Is you, Are you allowed? Uh, yeah, yeah. Countries have sent... Like, um, Ireland sent Jedward a couple of years. Okay. Yeah, you, they can represent multiple times. Well, yeah. there you go. Dummy Im for life. Holy shit. So there you go. That's a show. Quite a big show. It is. In fact. But uh, we've got a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. You can tell that it's a, <laughs> it is a rainy, sleepy day. We, we have uh, kept up that energy as long as we could, and that is just nosedive yeah, straight to the ending. It's like, you know it's probably too long for the audience, but it's just too long for me. Uh, <laughs> just like, that's it. That's ah. it. Uh, go to frillispursuits.com, iTunes, Patreon. Is Sti- are we on Stitcher? I don't know. Someone tell me if we're on Stitcher. Uh, all that stuff, rate, yeah. review. Go to Facebook as well on our pages and things and like it. Um, King Arthur lived in. There won't be another Camelot. Not another Camelot.